Well, good morning, Tiffany Fellowship Church. And good morning to our pit boss champ. How you doing over there, Jeff? Let's give Jeff a big, big round of applause. I had the privilege of being one of the judges, and if you didn't get to taste his barbecue, we're gonna have one real soon again, and I'm sure you'll, you'll he's gonna have to defend. He got the belt, but he's gonna have to defend the belt, okay? So that's gonna be tough, because I already hear people coming after it. Jeff, they're coming after it. So if you were, if you were here for our barbecue Wednesday night, it, you know it was great. How many of you were here for that? Could I just see your hands? Wasn't that fun? That was fun. Let's do it again real soon. And uh, so appreciate that. Are you ready for the Word of God? All right, if you have your Bibles, and you should, turn with me to Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 29, 18 through 29. Revelation 2, verses 18 through 29. From the cave of the apocalypse on the island of Patmos, the last surviving disciple of Jesus, the beloved John, brings forth under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit a revelation of what will happen at the end of time. In that revelation, chapter two and three, Jesus himself gives John seven letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And they contain uncannily accurate descriptions and details of the historical and geological and historic context of all of these cities. Uncannily accurate. And they contain both commendations and condemnations of these churches. During my recent trip to Turkey, I had the rare privilege to visit, study, and record my time at these ancient archaeological locations, and they are there, rising out of the dust and dirt of western Anatolia, just like the Bible says they are. And in those days, the church met in Jewish synagogues and in private homes. The church met in private homes. And so when, you, when, when Jesus addresses the church in a city, it's, it could be more than one home church, and they would occasionally all come together at the synagogue if they could, or a public place. But they did not meet in specific church buildings until a couple of hundred years later, actual church buildings began to be built. And for today's study, in the, for the church of Thyatira, we can actually see the physical remains of one of the oldest churches in the world. It was a basilica dating to between 500 and 600 AD in the city of Thyatira. Would you like to see it? All right, let's take a look at my trip there.
the smallest town, not that big a deal. It's not Ephesus, it's not Corinth, you know, certainly not Rome, but they have a certain amount of local prosperity based on this work. To do the work, you have to be a part of the, of the guild. Well, the guilds had their roots in paganism. The main patron god around here was Apollo. And so as a guild, on a yearly basis, you would have like a guild celebration at the temple. And at that event, there would be certainly food offered idols. That's all it was. You're feasting in a temple to Apollo, right. to Apollo. Uh, and then also, as a part of that, there would be, uh, let's say, drunken debauchery. Right. If you came along and said, you know, I don't want to do that. I, I'm just not going to do that. I'm a Christian now. Right. I can't be going to the pagan temple to eat to Apollo, to feast before him. Well, then you're, the guys would come back at you. You know, we like you, Barry, but um, our prosperity is based on the approval of the God. Yeah. And if we let you be a member and not do this, then Apollo might get mad at us and well, you know, the building might burn down or one of our kids might get sick. And so, so what was happening here is the Christians are losing their jobs. Right. If you became a real Christian who really followed Jesus, then you're gonna lose your job. That's tough, Yeah. but that's really tough. Did you appreciate that? Excellent. Listen, Thyatira, Thyatira was a union town. Of all of the cities of Revelation, Thyatira was completely, it was a small city, but it was chock full of guilds. You couldn't make a living in the city if you weren't a member of a, a guild, which was like a trade union. And uh, so, uh, you saw in that archaeological park not only a basilica uh, that dates back to 500, 600 B.C., but there were many stones. I don't know if you were able to see that, but there were stones with carvings in them. How many of you saw that? All over the place, stones with carvings in them. Those carvings are the names of the unions that were in that town, the guilds that were in, there, in that town. And so this place was, was a union town, and it was, it was a closed shop. I mean, if you weren't in the union, you didn't, you didn't make money in Thyatira. Let's stand together and let's read what Jesus has to say to the church in Thyatira from Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 through 29. We'll begin to see the context begin to emerge as we understand what was going on in this city. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these are the words of the Son of God. Let's put, a, let's put a pause there. The Son of God. Let me ask you, how many of you know a little bit about Greek mythology? Who, who is, uh, who is uh, Apollo's dad? Does anyone know who Apollo? Zeus, right? And Zeus was what? The king of gods, right? The god of gods. He was the king of gods. So Apollo was Zeus's son, so he would be called what? The son of God right? But what does Jesus say? Look at what he says. These are the words of the Son of God, <laughs> right? Apollo's not the Son of God. I'm the Son of God. That's interesting, isn't it? Whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Again, there's a reference to one of the guilds. One of the most popular guilds in the city of Thyatira was the bronze sculptors and the bronze molders, okay? And so Jesus refers to that. It's interesting, very interesting. He says, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and your faith, your, uh, your service and perseverance and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. And by her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of foods sacrificed to idols. 
I've given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am the one who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teachings and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, put a pin in that one, we'll talk about that in a minute, I will, impose, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold uh, on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my Father, I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Can you say amen to God's word? Teach us out of it, Lord, and we will obey. It is your word that we come to understand and to know and to obey. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Today we dive into the Revelation city of Thyatira. Thyatira. Now, the first two churches in Revelation, for the first two I looked at in this series, I introduced the message with five things that properly establish the context of the prophecy of Revelation, and those principles certainly apply to today's look at Thyatira, but I want to very quickly introduce the message by renewing last week's, kind of reviewing last week's commonalities of the churches and the letters of Revelation. So let's look, and uh, why don't we just throw them all up there, and I'm going to go through them quickly. These are five things that these churches and these letters all have in common. Number one, these letters are both historic and prophetic. You need to understand that when you're reading that, they are, they are both historic and prophetic. In other words, they addressed churches and circumstances from the first century and the 21st century. See, this isn't just history we're talking about, it's hereafter. It's both history and hereafter. This is why in each of those letters, Jesus says, whoever is reading this has ears to hear, let them hear. In other words, pay attention, have ears to hear, what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Number two, the second commonality, the churches then and today were and are facing true existential threats. You see, the same challenges that threaten to destroy the first century church threatens to destroy the 21st century church. Yes, listen, we are facing existential threats. We are. The same challenges that threaten to destroy the church in Jesus' day when he wrote this, wrote this is threatening to destroy the church today. The persecution, the temptation, the demonic influence, the suffering, the mission drift, as much as, as a threat, is as much a threat to the continued existence of the church today as it ever was. And Jesus said, listen to me, Jesus said, I will build my church, but Satan says, I will destroy his church. Number three, Jesus has both reward and rebuke for the church both reward and rebuke. Jesus doesn't excuse and ignore the mistakes and failures of the church. I love the fact that he doesn't bury his head in the sand. He doesn't just defend the church without, you know, without thinking about reality. He is clear when he says sometimes the church is functioning faithfully, but also sometimes it's fatally flawed. Jesus says that. Sometimes it's functioning faithfully. Sometimes it's fatally flawed. The church, Jesus is saying, needs constant constructive correction. Constant constructive correction. Number four, despite cultural pressure, governmental persecution, and sexual persuasion, Jesus expects and demands that the church be victorious. In every single one of these letters to these seven churches, he talks about the overcomer, to him who overcomes, to him who is victorious, to the one who is victorious. Jesus expects their candlesticks to spread the light of the gospel influence all around them and even to the end of the earth. He expects it. 
And I'd like to use the same outline, three sections as I did, for the churches in Ephesus and Pergamum. We're going to look at three sections today. First, I want to look at how Jesus commends the church in Thyatira. Then I want to look at how he condemns the church in Thyatira. Then we'll conclude by looking at some ways that we can apply, we can apply to our church today the warning of the church of Thyatira. First of all, Jesus commends the church in Thyatira. Jesus commends the church. When we read the Thyatira church, what jumps off the page at us, right, is what Jesus calls that woman Jezebel, right? When you read that, that just leaps off the page. It's like, whoa, 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 hang on, bad church, bad church. This is bad, man. And so many preachers, I, I listened to a lot of uh, sermons in my preparation on, on this. I read a lot of books, a lot of commentators, listened to a lot of sermons. And it, it just seems like everybody who preaches about fire tire, this is a bad church. This is a bad church. It's got the, we've got Jezebel and it's a bad church. And immediately, that's where our brain goes because that's what jumps off the page. But wait, 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 wait. Jesus has some great things to say about this church. He has some commendation for this church. And I want to point out three things, three good things he says about the church of of Thyatira. And the first two are in what is called doublets. These are are kind of put together in the rhetorical version of this. They're doublets. They're meant to be together. So let's look at all three of these good things. The first two are doublets. The first doublet is this. Number one, Jesus commends them. He says they were faithfully and lovingly devoted to God. This church was faithfully and lovingly devoted to God. Look at verse 19. I know your deeds, your love and faith. That's toward God. We, lo, he lo, they love God, and they had faith in God. Okay? So their heart was right. They were filled with faith and love for God. You say, but wait, wait, what about Jezebel? We're getting there, we're getting there, we're getting there. But let's look at how Jesus commends the church. He says, your heart is right faithfully and lovingly devoted to God. Secondly, the second uh, doublet is this. They, they endured patiently in their devoted service to each other. Okay? Look at verse 19. I know your deeds are service and perseverance. Okay? Your service and perseverance. They endured patiently in their devoted service to each other. In other words, Jesus is saying you've got the vertical down pat. You're loving and faithful to God and you're devoted to each other in patient endurance and service. Now, let me just say, we're getting a hint of, maybe getting a hint of what's to come because perhaps they were a little too, too devoted in service to each other. A little too intolerant. A a little too, excuse me, a little too tolerant, okay? So they had the vertical, they had the horizontal down. Let's look at the third commendation that Jesus has For the church in Thyatira, they were progressing, not regressing. Hey, that's good news, right? Look at verse 19. I know your deeds and that you are not only doing, that you are now doing more than you did at first. Okay? In other words, you're getting better, not worse. That's good. You're on an uphill trajectory. That's good news. He commends them for that. You're doing better than at first. Now, this is interesting because not all churches can say that. In fact, the author of the Revelation volume of the Understanding the Bible Commentary, his name is Robert W. Wall, he points out an important fact. i got to give him credit for it. He writes this, and I quote, in contrast to the Ephesian church, now look at the Ephesian church, right? The biggest and the best. They had Paul as their teacher. They had Timothy. They had Mother Mary in their church. They had, they had all the John, they had all the good teachers, but in contrast to the Ephesian church, this congregation's witness was growing rather than waning. The real issue, however, is the, is the issue to which all the moral advice of Revelation is directed. It is whether they will do my will to the end. Can they sustain it to the end? So, listen, keep in mind Keep in mind, as we go through the rest of this teaching, this church was not all bad, right? This church was not all bad. Jesus has a lot of good things to say about it. Now, we covered the good news. (sighs) Now the bad news. The bad news. The second section we're going to look at is how Jesus 
condemns the church in Thyatira. Jesus has two condemning things to say to the church in Thyatira. His condemnation of the church in Thyatira is centered on the compromising influence of an agent of Satan within the church that Jesus calls, and I quote, that woman Jezebel. She thinks of herself as a prophet. Now listen, since no Jewish or Christian, no self-respecting Jew or Christian would ever name their daughter Jezebel, and if you're sitting here this morning, and when you hear that name, you're thinking, oh, that'd be a good name. That'd be a great name for my... You need to go back and read 1 Kings chapter 18, and you'll find out, no, 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 not a good namesake, right? Not a good namesake, Jezebel. And so no self-respecting Jew or Christian would ever name their daughter Jezebel. And so we are compelled to believe that Jesus was using the Old Testament Jezebel as an example of satanic influence in the New Testament church. Understand this. Who calls her Jezebel? Jesus does. Right? Okay. Some scholars, now listen, some scholars refer to this idea as the, quote unquote, the Jezebel spirit. And that's a popular belief these days, and it's bantied around a lot, the Jezebel spirit. And you know what? You know what? That may be true. That may be true. But we need to remember, and hear me out, hear me closely, and back me up on this, check me out on this. There is no biblical reference to a literal Jezebel spirit. Go search it yourself. You will find a Jezebel spirit nowhere in the Bible. Let's keep in mind that. So, so people have said, well, that's a spirit of Jezebel. And again, that may be true, but there's no biblical reference to a literal Jezebel. So Jesus calls her Jezebel. Why? Probably because she was so similar to the Old Testament Jezebel. The New Testament Jezebel and the Old Testament Jezebel were very, very similar. Let's examine the two compromising influences that Jezebel taught the church in Thyatira. The two compromising influences that Jezebel taught the church in Thyatira. Number one, Jesus condemns the compromising influence of economic idolatry. Write that down if you're taking notes. Economic, economic idolatry. Verse 20. Nevertheless, listen to this. Listen to this closely. I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants. Look at this. Into the eating of food sacrificed to idols. Now what in the world does that mean? Well, let me explain it. Remember in the video that I just showed where Jameson Creel was talking to you about the guilds? I mean, their names are carved all over in stones in the archaeological park of Thyatira. You cannot be in a guild or a trade union in Thyatira if you do not go to the temple feasts of Apollo, the son of God, right? And it is at those feasts that you ate food that was ceremoniously and religiously sacrificed to the god Apollo. You went to the guild feasts at the temple of the god. Your economic success depended on whether you showed up or not and how well you feasted. The god's favor would be on your guild. And Jezebel... Listen, Jezebel was using her compromising influence to lead the Thyatiran Christians into the worship of Apollo. Listen to what Jesus says in verse 24. Listen to his words. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teachings and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets. I underline that because that's very important. I told you we're going to talk about that. She, listen to me, Jezebel was most likely calling her gift of prophecy what Paul called in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 10. Look at this, the deep things of God. Paul, in Corinthians, when he's talking about, about the gift of prophecy, he's talking, about prof he's talking about the deep things of God. And probably, this Jezebel, who called herself a prophet, 
was saying, listen, he flips it on her. He's saying, this is not the deep things of God you're teaching. Jezebel, you're teaching the deep secrets of Satan. You with me? This is what this means. Okay? So here's what she was most likely saying. Okay? Here's what she was most likely saying. Something like this. Here's how it probably would have sounded. Listen, I've been given the prophetic gift of understanding the deep things of God. I have a gift, and I can understand the deep things of God. And you know what? God showed me you don't have to give up your guild membership to be a Christian. You can go to the temple and participate in in the feast to Apollo outwardly, but inwardly, spiritually, you can remain faithful to God. I've been given a deep secret that only prophets know. Listen to me. You can still be a Christian and go to the feasts. That's probably how she was using her, and I put quotation marks here for those who are listening to the podcast, her gift of prophecy. Right? Okay. She's urging them to go to church and worship Yahweh on Sunday, but go to the temple on Monday through Saturday and worship Apollo. And she's saying it's just business, right? It's just business. Like, how many of you ever heard that? It's just business. It's like, in business, you can get away with things because it's a business. There's a very popular movie starring... Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks, I don't know if you've seen it, You've Got Mail, I think it's You've Got Mail, is it You've Got Mail, where she owns this little bookshop store, this is not in my notes, which I should never do this, she's got this little bookstore that sells these books, right, and Tom Hanks comes with a big Barnes and Noble bookstore, and he's he's, you know, soaking up all the business, and her little shop on the corner has to go out of business, and he gets to know her, and he's like, hey, it's just business, it's like, you, you can get away with stuff ethically and morally because it's just business. And this is what she was probably saying. It's, it's just business. And God, listen to me, have you ever heard this? God wants you to prosper, doesn't he? Okay, so I want to ask you a question. Let's begin to apply this to our life. What business ethics would you be willing to compromise for the sake of economic gain? Think, think about it. Have you ever been put in that position? We're in the business world, in your job outside, your Monday through Friday job. Have you ever been tempted to, to overpromise and underdeliver? It's business. If I overpromise, I'll get the job. And then I'll do right later. Hmm. Compromise. All right. The second condemnation that Jesus has for the church in Thyatira is number two. Jesus condemns the compromising influence of sexual immorality. Okay. Economic idolatry, where we, where we put money in the place of God, and he's saying, some of you, because of the influence of this prophet Jezebel, are putting sexual immorality in the place of God. Look at verse 20. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet, and by her teaching she misleads my servants into sexual immorality. Again, Jezebel was using her compromising influence to lead the Thyatiran Christians into the sexual worship of Apollo. Perhaps it sounded like something like this. I've, I've been given a deep revelation from God. See, this is sometimes how false prophets talk. I know some things that you don't know because I have a gift. I have the gift of prophetic insight. And I have this deep revelation from God. And since the body, hear me out, since the body is physical and God is spirit and must be worshiped in spirit and in truth, then the spirit, that's what's truth. And so God doesn't really mind what you do with your bodies as long as your spirits are faithful to him. So you can go to the temple of Apollo and when things get weird, when things get weird and you've had maybe a little too much to drink and things start getting a little sexual, it's it's your body after all. Your spirit can remain faithful to God, right? 
right? Listen to how Leon Morris, writing for the Tyndale Complete Commentary on Revelation, sums it up. He says, and I quote, Jezebel apparently reasoned that an idol was of no consequence and advised Christians to eat such meals, that these meals all too readily in, uh, degenerated into sexual looseness made matters worse. It enabled them to maintain a Christian profession while countenancing and even engaging in immoral heathen revels. That Jezebel was a prophetess gave their course some standing. The prophet says we can. And just like Jezebel of the Old Testament, God had given this Jezebel of the New Testament a chance to repent, and she didn't. So, he judged the New Testament Jezebel with the same judgment as the Old Testament Jezebel. Let's read in verses 21 and 22 of chapter 2. I've given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. Question. Question of application. What moral conviction would you be willing to compromise for the sake of sexual satisfaction? Think about it. What moral conviction would you be willing to compromise for the sake of sexual satisfaction? You know, it's like, well, God, God you know, as long as I repent afterwards, God has to forgive me, right? I can, I, I, I can look at that nudity, I can look at that point, and I'll just repent later. God will forgive me. It's everybody's doing it, right? Hmm. Have you ever been tempted to justify sinful sexual behavior? Maybe the compromising influence has led you to places that are dark and sinful. So, how do we apply this warning of God's judgment? How do we apply this warning of the Thyatira Tire Church to the church today? Let's look at that for the, just the next few moments, and I want to quickly give you four things that we can do, four things that we should do as individuals and as a church to heed the Thyatira warning to the church today. Number one, we must be hyper-discerning of any satanic influence to compromise our biblical convictions. I know that's a mouthful. Take your time if you're writing it down. We must be hyper-discerning of any satanic influence to compromise our biblical convictions. Now listen, if we're going to err... I say we err more on paranoia as opposed to permissiveness. Hypervigilant. Hypervigilant. We must listen to the warning of Jesus to the church in Thyatira today. Be discerning. See, listen to me. Hear me out. There are voices within the church world today, listen to me, within the church world today that are claiming progressive revelation from God that certain sexual practices are, are acceptable. They use phrases like, well, love is love, and God is love, right? So, you know, love is love. Or, or, or maybe they use this terminology. God made you this way, so you should express who you really are. Within the church, these voices more and more and more. There's one very popular voice within the church world who is fond of saying, and I've heard this person say it many times, people know how bad they are. So when folks come into our church, we want to tell them how good they are. Now, I don't think we should just beat up on each other just for the sake of beating up on each other. But let me just tell you something. We have to understand 
that we can't come to Christ and find forgiveness of our sins until we know that we ourselves are sinners. And listen to me, that's not beating up on ourselves, that's being realistic. Listen, we need a Savior. We're sinners and we need a Savior. And Jesus is forgiving when we repent and confess our sins. He's faithful and just and will forgive us. Nobody is helped and blessed by coming into church week after week after week and have a pastor stand behind the pulpit saying, you're good, you're so good, you're good. It's all good, it's good, you're good, you're all good. The fact is we're sinners but God is good, and he forgives us when we confess. Number two, we must be willing to endure economic sacrifice and sexual restraint for the sake of moral purity. We must be willing to endure economic sacrifice and sexual restraint for the sake of moral purity. A couple of weeks ago, Randy Reed of Reed Automotive came in and right from behind this pulpit said that he put his whole business on the line for a moral belief in life. And he said, if they make us compromise our moral belief, we're going to sell the business and we're getting out of it. He was willing to make that sacrifice for his moral conviction. We got to be willing to do that. Look at Revelation 2, 24 and 25. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you, look at this, except to hold on to what you have until I come. Hold on. Look at me, you know how hard it is to hold on, right? The whole current of culture is coming at us like a stream that we can't resist. You need to conform, you need to conform, you need to get with the flow. No, Jesus says to the church in Thyatira, hold on, hold on, don't let go. Hold on until I come. Number three. We must never go along to get along. We must never go along to get along. We should never look for a fight. We should never relish a moral argument. We shouldn't go around picking a fight. We shouldn't be mean with people for the sake of disagreement. But listen to me, too often, we let our silence imply our agreement and our affirmation. We do this all the time. We go along to get along. Well, I'm not gonna say anything. I don't wanna rock the boat. I don't wanna be the bad guy. I don't wanna ruin the family fun. I don't wanna be that guy. Again, I don't think we should rock the boat just for the sake of rocking the boat. But sometimes when we are silent, it implies our assent and our agreement. We should never. This, look, at, look at verse 26. This, the verse 26 just says it all. Look what Jesus says. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. And by her teaching, she misleads my servants. You tolerate. You know what he's saying? You go along. You go along to get along. You, you're not all bad. Some of you haven't done it, but some of you are going along to get along. He's saying. Do you know? Do you know what that Greek word "tolerate" means in the original language? The, the Koine Greek, it means, let me give you some, some, some nuance to this. It means to dismiss, to leave, to depart from, to desert, to forsake, to leave remaining, or to leave alone. In other words, you're, you're ignoring, you're leaving that. You're just, you're ignoring that. And you think by ignoring it, it's just going to go away. Jesus is saying, don't ignore or dismiss or leave alone this compromising trend in the church. Deal with the Jezebel. 
don't tolerate. Number four. Last one. (laughs) Fourth way we apply this warning to the church in Thyatira, to our church today. Number four, we must hold fast to the hope of the eventual triumph of the righteous and the destruction of the wicked. We must hold fast to the hope of the eventual triumph of the righteous and the destruction of the wicked. You say, look, a culture's coming at us. We're in for it. What are we going to do? We're going to get bowled over. They're going to they're gonna take us all hot. No, listen. Listen, there's coming a day. There's coming a day when God's going to right the scales. Let me show you the scripture. First, the triumph of the, of the righteous, the victorious. In, in verse 29 of chapter 2, to the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. The eventual triumph of the righteous. Now let's look at scriptures backing up the destruction of the wicked from our text, verse 22 and 23. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. What? Don't look now, but Old Testament God is coming at You know, what Christianity, you know what progressive Christianity tries to do? Take the teeth out of God. Oh, Jesus. Jesus would never. Jesus is so kind. Jesus is so forgiving. He's so loving. But look what raises its head right here. The Old Testament version of God. By the way, we talked about this on Wednesday. I'm I'm developing a whole, I'm reading, I'm in the middle of preparing for a whole, like a sermon that I got got from Wednesday night on the difference between the Old Testament God and the New Testament God. This is going to be a good one. Don't don't miss that one. Anyway. The late professor, what, no, verse 18, another destruction of the wicked, verse 18. Look at this. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these are the words of the Son of God, (laughs) whose feet are like burnished bronze. I want you to understand that, because really, that's an allusion to the judgment of God. Remember I told you about about the the guilds in Thyatira, and there was this bronze guild. They they were known for their bronze, bronze, the guild of bronze. And so Jesus makes a reference to this. It's really interesting. In verse 18, he says, these are words of the Son of God, whose feet are like burnished bronze. And I like how the late Professor Alan Johnson in the Expositor Bible Commentary puts it. He writes this, and I quote, the simile of the feet like burnished bronze represent triumphant judgment, treading or trampling down of those who are unbelieving and unfaithful to the truth of Christ. See, bronze was the hardest known metal at this particular time. And so he has feet like bronze. And he's going to, what does it say in future verses of Revelation? Trampling out the grapes of wrath. Judgment. Jesus is going to come and make it all right. He's going to balance the scales. Hang on till he comes. Don't give up. Don't quit until he comes. You with me? All right, musicians, come. We're going to conclude this service. Let me conclude with a word of warning. As the musicians are coming, focus this way. This is very, very important. Let me conclude with a word of warning. It's very popular to label people these days as having the Jezebel spirit. This is very popular. I see it all the time. But I want to warn you about that. Jesus is the judge. And we can damage someone's soul by calling them a Jezebel. Do do you get what I mean? We we think we're doing right. Call it out! I'm going to call. No. This is where the church can sometimes be fatally flawed. When we point our judgmental finger at other people, you have the Jezebel spirit. Jesus is the only one who should do that.
This was not meant, this was not written, this part of the letter that Jesus writes to Thyatira was not meant to be a weapon that people use against someone. He was calling out this one instance, similarities in this prophet from the Old Testament and the New. So let's be very careful. So, I want to ask you one more question before we conclude this morning. Just think about this for a minute. Where are you in the story of Thyatira? Where do you fit? Where do you belong? Where do you naturally rest? Are you faithfully loving your, in your devotion to God and to others? Are you vertically and horizontally on a good place? Your heart right with God? Is your heart right with God? Can Jesus' commendation to the church in Thyatira apply to you? Or have you been tempted and possibly have compromised your moral integrity? Can I just say, listen to me, purity, look at me, purity is very unpopular in our culture today. The church is criticized for emphasizing purity. Have you noticed that? You, you can hear it on the streets. Oh, that church, they, boy, they have such a, a more sexual purity. Oh, they're damaging people by focusing on purity. There's all kinds of pressure for us to compromise. All kinds of pressure to compromise. Are you faithfully holding fast to what remains of your convictions? Are you hanging on for dear life? Jesus is coming, friends. He's coming. Don't let go. Don't give in. I know sometimes that the biblical stand is unpopular. It's so unpopular. But we've got to hang on. We've got to hang on to the end or are you tempted and tempting others to follow you into moral compromise where are you in the story where are you have you compromised in the past are you tempted <laughs> stand with me this afternoon and let's conclude this service we have some prayer partners who are going to come and they're ready to pray for you for healing, provision, wisdom, whatever your prayer need is this morning, uh, we're, we're here today to, to pray with you. There's no judgment here. Are you right with God? Maybe you need to get right with God today. Today's your day. I'm going to say a prayer, and the worship team's going to sing a song, and we got some time to just sit with this. Let the Holy Spirit convict us. Listen to the words of warning from the Jesus to the church in Thyatira. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for writing this letter of commendation and condemnation to the church in Thyatira. We repent for listening to the seductive voice of Jezebel who is luring us into the trap of compromise. Forgive us for tolerating her influence upon us. Convict us, Holy Spirit that we might learn to discern and resist her teachings that tempt us to justify immoral behavior. We hold fast to the truth of the Bible and hold out hope for your eventual return when the wicked will be destroyed and the righteous victorious. And we pray these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you need prayer, please come. Please come, worship team.